and Wells Fargo. And a special thank you, deepest appreciation to Deborah Zipser and Craig Emanuel for helping us make this possible. As promised at the beginning of the evening, we're going to take a moment to announce the winners of this year's Student and Emerging Filmmaker Competition. And to do that, here is Emmy Award winning festival curator, shorts program producer, and the brain trust behind our competition, Opal Hope Bennett. Screen and, uh, and to bring to you. So without further ado, I'm going to start with our student um, films. We have competitions in both nonfiction uh, and fiction. And our student documentary running up this year goes to Healing in Color by Nana Adwa Frimpong. Is not with us, guys. Don't worry. You, you, you don't. You don't have a thing there for her. <laughs> We're gonna mail it to her, but hopefully she's uh, she's streaming. So greetings to you in California, Nana. Thank you for sharing your work with us. Um, but our grand prize winner is uh, by a former uh, contestant who was honored as an emerging filmmaker and came back with his daughter this year, and they won the grand prize. Uh, student documentary, Quarantine Kids, by Bilal Motley and his daughter, Bria Motley. I thought they'd be with us because they were here last night. Well, we do have their award, but all right, moving right along. Okay, on to our emerging category. Uh, these are films made by filmmakers who made their first film within the past five years. Um, so we usually have a broad array of folks who are sometimes just starting out or folks who might have shifted uh, careers and are a bit older. So our emerging documentary runner-up this year is When We Fight by Yoni Golev. Uh, please give it a Yoni said his mom would be here. Are you, are you in the audience by any chance? No? Okay. <laughs> uh, and our grand prize is also not here. This is really anticlimactic. Uh, <laughs> goes to Bad Hombre Wood, uh, which is a brilliant film by uh, Guillermo Torres. So congratulations, Guillermo. <laughs> All right, our last category is the Emerging Filmmaker Narrative category. And our runner-up this year is Color uh, by Carly Rogers. <laughs> and the grand prize goes to Otis's Dream by uh, D uh, True and Blue are the directors, but I, I do believe we have one of the producers here with us. Otis's Dream? Oh yes, please.
and that's all we've got. On with the show. Thanks so much. For those of you who haven't seen any of the films, all of them are on our festival website, and they're always very delightful. We get entries from all across the country. The first year, 2020, when we started doing this virtually, everything was virtual, and we were able to track that. We got submissions from 48 of the 50 states. We weren't sure what was wrong with the Dakotas, but <laughs> <laughs> we were asking people, is anybody there? So uh, please look at all of the films on the website. So now we're going to unpack Acting While Black and this movement in French cinema with our panelists. First up is a friend of the festival and a filmmaker, the filmmaker of Acting While Black. We've screened other of her films in past festivals, and I'm so impressed with her output of information and educational entertainment. She is also an author, host of BET Friends, a global opinion writer for the Washington Post, and an activist at the intersection of race, religion, and gender politics. Here's Rokaya Jalu. I used to be able to do that. <laughs> Our next panelist is another friend of the festival. She's a digital storyteller, director, producer, and filmmaker who writes, teaches at George Washington University, and travels the world documenting issues that impact and involve people of the African diaspora. Please welcome Dr. Imani Cheers. Our moderator is also an activist, Afro-feminist, author and scholar, specializing in studies on the U.S. and Afro-American diaspora at the University of Tours. We are so happy to have her with us on this side of the Atlantic. Please welcome Mabulu Sumoharo. Good evening, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Is it on? Ah. Okay. This is really about cinema, isn't it? <laughs> so is the light okay? Proper lighting. Proper lighting for black skin? Yeah. yeah. Okay, okay. I don't want to look terrible and ashy on TV. You know, like <laughs> it has happened for far too long. So good evening, everyone. Thank you. Yes, yes, um, an audience talking back, which is always good. Thank you um, to um, the March on Washington uh, Film Festival, and congratulations for your festival. And thank you for having me. This is a great joy and uh, a great honor. So I, uh, I hope I can become a friend of the festival. Okay, <laughs> meaning I'll be back next year and the year after that. <laughs> The French way, the French way. Anyway, okay, so we are just going to uh, jump into the conversation. I have uh, questions for Rokaya Diallo, the director, and for Dr. Imani Cheers. Um, and we are going to try to unpack what we just saw on screen, right? So perhaps we'll begin with a question for Rokaya, a very general question. Can you tell us about this idea for this documentary? How did, how did the project come into being? What were you trying to achieve, and what were the conditions and circumstances of the production of this documentary? Uh, thank you. Thanks to the festival for having me. I'm really happy to be back here, and thank you for attending the screening. I'm really proud to show it uh, on that side of the Atlantic. Um, so the, the film I was directed in 2020, um, it, actually it was not my idea, it was uh, authored by Richard Coney uh, and Ali Rebey, who have been thinking about that documentary for a long time, a documentary about 
black people on, on French screens for a long time. And the, the idea of the documentary has been re rejected by many, many channels, including the, the, the public service. And at some point, Ali Rebi, who is the voice on the documentary, who is a very famous uh, radio host on France Inter in France, uh, dropped the project because he, couldn't, he didn't have um, enough time to uh, be part of the documentary. So the producers came to me um, in, in order to, to ask me if I was interested. And uh, the thing is that um, I decided to take the, 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 the challenge and, to, and I rewrote the whole uh, documentary realizing while I was writing that I had that idea uh, in my mind all my life. Like I've been like thinking about uh, representations of uh, black bodies on the French screens for a very long time. So it really came very easily uh, while I was writing and I decided to put uh, maybe more intersectional perspective, focusing on the, 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 the very um, fetishization of uh, black women on screen, which is a very specific experience. And that's how it started. So that was interesting because uh, um, some of the producers uh, who were white, uh, were the, they asked me to be the, the director of the, the, documentary, the documentary because um, I was visible in France and I knew that uh, it would draw some attention on the documentary, but at the same time I felt that all the way along they, they were afraid of what I w was doing with the film. So it was an internal struggle, so I did what I wanted at the end of the, of the day, but they were watching everything I was trying to, 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 to tell about, even like starting the film with uh, Lucien Jean-Baptiste saying that uh, uh, as, as a child, uh, the only example he had about you know, something with an African background was uh, Tarzan and the, and, the, and the monkey cheetah. Uh, they told, like, I, I remember the film, the, 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 film um, the producer told me, oh, it's very violent to start like that, to start like that. And he told me, like, um, like I, I want the, the, the documentary to, I want people, like, uh, average people to be able to identify, to, 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 to feel included while watching the movie. And I, and I asked him, like, what kind of average people? Because my mother is an average viewer. And she has no problem with starting the film that way. So are you meaning white average people? And, uh, and that was really interesting conversations while making the documentary because like you always have this idea in France of speaking about the issues, but not really, you know, wanting, willing to go deep into the issue. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. And perhaps a follow-up question before I turn to you. Um, should I call you doctor or Imani? How? Imani is perfect. Imani. <laughs> doctor Imani is fine? Yeah. Whatever you like. <laughs> I am just here. I'm just grateful to be here. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah, perhaps you can tell us a little more about the general context of France at the time when you were making that documentary. Is there anything that we, the audience, need to understand about what was going on at that particular time period? It was before, it was months before the global Black Lives Matter movement uh, and before the, the, that wave hit France. So it was the time when France was still thinking that black people didn't exist. So, <laughs> so it, was, it was not really easy. And it's interesting because the public service um, did not accept to, to, to buy the film. And it was, um, it was uh, bought by a channel which name is RMC Story. But the channel has in its... Um, how can I say it? Um, it's part of the, uh, the duties, or it's of part the, of, the of the channel to, to represent the diversity, diversity. So they had to do something at some point. Um, and uh, what was interesting is that the, the same channels who refused to have that documentary after the Black Lives Matter hit, you know, here and France. Produ uh, like uh, aired a, a documentary about blackness in France. But it was only because of the way that they realized that they needed to do something. So the film came a little early, and, uh, and actually it was aired on TV the first day of the lockdown. So that was not good for the film. But the, like the, the um, replay, don't say replay, the replay. The rerun? Yeah, the rerun, like the online rerun, were really successful. But the day of the, of the, um, of the first airing, everybody had something else in mind, so including myself. So it was not uh, really easy, and I didn't have a chance to promote it because we were starting to focus on on COVID and uh, all the consequences. Thank you. <laughs>
So Imani, uh, can I ask you how you, you know, you approach the film? What do you see uh, in the film? What do you, you know, how do you view it based on your expertise of, I, I you mean, know, well, storytelling? I, yeah, the expertise of storytelling. But what what I find so compelling in in your work are are not only the parallels of the stereotypical representation of of black people in film, but starting with Tarzan, um, moving to I don't know about the audience, but I am familiar with like Omer uh, Say through Lupin. Is anyone familiar with Lupin? Yeah. Right. Um, so so coming in and, and understanding um, that particular um, actor and his role, but not even realizing the the decades long uh, career and work that he had done prior. You know, we also in lockdown had many um, hours to consume content, um, but Lupin is one that I consume in about a day. I didn't need many hours. I, I literally watched the entire um, series in one sitting, and I found it really, really compelling the way in which you were able to combine um, the historical context with also our contemporary um, challenges that ultimately parallel the United States in, in so many ways. As you just mentioned, um, the fact that you know French audiences um, might not see um, their black citizens as as you know contributors to to culture and and that's what I feel like and I'm not trying to par you know you know paraphrase for my, for my colleagues or the entire African um, American diaspora but we have struggled in in the United States in a very similar way to be valued to be seen to not be stereotyped um, the images of the minstrel um, shows that were in the very beginning of the film um, are still incredibly painful to to see and to watch so I mean I, I will keep my fangirl to a minimum, but it's just, it's such an amazing, amazing piece of work, and it's such a phenomenal, um, phenomenal story that, that are, we're just so grateful um, to see. And I just also want to preface for those of a certain age, Gary Dudron, you might know him from CSI, but I know him from Janet Jackson's yeah. again, okay? <laughs> All right? For those who know the Gary Dudron, in, in a different world, right? But it was way before CSI, all right? Just saying. Put it out there. So to continue this conversation, but I don't know if I should go back to Janet Jackson and the good old days. I will always and derail, be or should we stick to the program? Is, is anyone, you know, keeping the time? Because I think it's gonna, we good? <laughs> Um, so the, the, the question that I wanted to uh, follow up on, Imani, is um, what do you, you mentioned, you touched on, on it a little, what are the commonalities or the differences that we can, you know, further delve into when talking about, uh, you know, Rokaya's depiction of the black French experience and your knowledge of, you know, the African American experience, particularly in terms of, you know, representation on the screen. What, is there anything that struck you, surprised you, or that you recognized? I think what's most compelling are, are the true parallels. So looking at the way black French artists were viewed, especially my, my knowledge, my work, um, the work of my father, we go back to whether it be a Josephine Baker, but also we're really passionate about the way individuals such as a Gordon Parks um, or individuals such as um, James Baldwin and you know there are so many African American and black um, artists who who found that America was so hostile towards their blackness that France was actually a place of refuge and when I think of the fact that they went there for a place of refuge knowing that it was also a place that refuted yes. their entire existence. Mm -hmm. And that was something that I thought was a very interesting and compelling a, you know, parallel when you look at how there were so many black artists throughout the 19th and 20th century that were fleeing the racial violence in the United States and fled and, and expatriated 
themselves um, to France at a time that that French culture wasn't overwhelmingly as accepting of them, but it was more accepting than their country of birth. And it was more accepting of their blackness, although it was not willing to fully embrace their own black citizens. And it's a very interesting, disturbing, detrimental, you know, storytelling lineage that I found that you did a phenomenal job of, of really exploring and really kind of leaving some breadcrumbs because I hope those who have watched the film, who are engaging with the film, myself as educators who are, who are showing the film in their classrooms, who are, who are providing those parallels, which I think are really, really important and poignant. Thank you so much. Uh, that's interesting what you, no really, oh, I'm sorry. No, 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 I, wanted I was to, going I wanted to, to say, uh, can you respond? Ah, uh, yeah. But, so, <laughs> but I, I knew you, I knew you were, you were going to say that. <laughs> uh, just leave the stage. <laughs> Like, like the, um, thank you, thank you very much for your comments on my on my work. It really means a lot to me, um, and um, that's really interesting what you say about uh, how uh, France have been seen as a as a place of refuge for African American during the 20th century. Um, and I want to to get back to what Isa Maiga, actress Isa Maiga, said in the in the documentary, saying that like when the French Prince uh, of Bel Air come to TV, uh, it was a relief to her to see finally to finally see black people being respected. And she said also that uh, African American have always always belonged to the premium premium category of black people, and it was very different from the way uh, African people of uh, people who, whose parents were African were perceived. So when Josephine Baker was dancing and very successful in Paris, it was the exact same time when France was a colonial power. So at the time, Josephine Baker was celebrated. France was oppressing people in Africa, in Asia, people, you know, all around the world. So there has always been that double standard. Even today, if you come in Paris as an American, you will not be seen the same way as I'm seen. And the same way when I come here and people understand that I'm French, I'm not part of your problems anymore. <laughs> Like, people speak to me about fashion, about cheese, or whatever. <laughs> but, like, they don't, they don't see me as being part of the historical argument. So, like, that, that, um, that narrative of France being uh, so welcoming is still useful for our government. Like, for example, uh, Josephine Baker just entered the Pantheon, which is a monument that celebrates um, high, highly respected French figures, because Josephine Baker became French uh, during her life. And like the way her, she was celebrated was for the French government a way to say, look, France was, is, is so, so not racist that Josephine Baker came, came here. And uh, she's the, 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 the proof that people who complain today have no reason to complain. And, and she, if I may, and she's mm -hmm. also the first black woman to, to enter end. the Pantheon, mm -hmm. like ever. Wow. So yes. that's All the, black, yeah. wow. Yes. And that's interesting because she, as she fled the U.S., she was grateful to France. So there was no reason for her to say, bad, you know, negative things about France. That's the reason why she, also, she is also celebrated. And the only, the only um, moments when Josephine Baker criticized racism, racism was about uh, to, to speak about the U.S. When she came to speak to the March on Washington, and when she was rejected here uh, in restaurants, hotels. So she. Her, her position in France was so particular that she didn't have to deal with the same kind of racism that Africans had to deal with. And it's the same for all the, the other people who were there. Uh, even if James Baldwin actually wrote about Algerians, mm -hmm. because there was that kind of racism. He was there during the Algerian uh, revolution uh, and the, the, uh, the, the attack of, from France against the Algerian people. So that's, that's, that's interesting like, to see that still today, like uh, French TV would rather show and display Af African American people than French black people. Mm. So a question for each of you, what can we do about this situation? Should all black French people come to the US and African Americans <laughs> expatriate to France? Or, you know, like this, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of joking about it, but it's a real question. Uh, and it leads me to, um, you know, combine the two questions that I'm asking. What does it mean for you, Rokaya, to be screening, you know, your movie today in, you know, Washington DC in front of, uh, you know, partly, a partly African American audience? 
right? And what does it mean for you, Imani, to be in conversation, like to, to be having this, uh, you know, transatlantic, Afro-diasporic, uh, perhaps Pan-African, you know, <laughs> let's, let's dream conversation. What does it mean for each of you to talk about those issues, to make the parallel, to, you know, locate the commonalities, the tensions, the paradoxes? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll just jump in first because I want to put it out there. Um, I want to work with you. So oh, I'm just, with I'm just pleasure. Like, oh, I, my God. I'm just, like, claiming it right oh, now. Oh, wow. <laughs> um, uh, Thank but you. I think, I mean, I've, I've, I've spent my entire 42 years as, as a Pan-Africanist and, and working and growing up, in particular, in a, in a South African context and an anti-apartheid context, but understanding the way in which the power of of the medium and the power of storytelling and the power of film and the power of photography and, and the power of the image and how it can not only move societal norms but also bring about a, a, a camaraderie and a sense of community. So despite the fact that we are having this transnational pan-African solidarity conversation we're actually really talking about the same issues and, we're and the way in which black Americans are seen in television and film. And I love the montage that you did when you, when you looked at everything from a Fresh Prince of Bel Air to a Cosby show to a different world. To, like that entire um, montage I thought was really, really poignant as someone who grew up in, in the age of the 80s and 90s. And, and these were the images that, and, and you know, a different world, for example, just celebrated 35 years like two days ago, if I'm not mistaken, or three days ago um, when, that, when that show premiered and looking at the way in which we see all of these connections and I feel that it's our lived experiences are far more interconnected than they are than they are different and so it's not surprising to hear and to reiterate that there were black Americans that were able to go to France and be celebrated for their blackness while black French citizens were being demonized for their blackness. But the same thing was happening in America, right? And the same thing is still, unfortunately, happening in both countries. But my hope, at least, is that through storytelling and through the arts, that we can continue to find these connections and, and share common stories, because we are far more similar than we are different. Thank you. That gives so much hope. Thank you so much. <laughs> And to, to answer to your question, it's, it's um, very interesting that you mentioned uh, Omar Sy, Omar Sy, as you say here, yeah. Omar Sy, <laughs> Omar Sy, uh, because uh, right after his um, uh, his victory at the César, he he moved to LA with his family, and uh, he try, he started to get parts in blockbusters, in uh, Jurassic World, in X Men. Um, but at, so that really gave me gave him gave him a kind of prestige. Um, because you know, even if France, if France has a, a long uh, history, it's still a small country compared to the U.S. politically, and so people look up to the U.S. And when you are perceived as small in France, but you do something in the U.S., you're suddenly big. Like for me, uh, being um, you know writing for the Washington Post, being hired by Georgetown University, um, you know like spread mixed feeling among people who think, you know, I'm too extreme in France. And that really gives you a platform and a kind of respectability that is very helpful. And for example, Omar Ciso has raised his platform here by, uh, you know, being part of uh, blockbusters. But at the same time, he's used that to sign uh, two deals with uh, Netflix and the other one, I think it's uh, with Amazon, to produce French content. So in Cannes, he, he produced and played the first uh, character in a, in a film that is uh, named Father and Son, about a father and a son who comes uh, who come from Senegal in the First World War, World War to fight uh, on behalf of France. And so he's using his, his, his power actually to push French narratives. And I think that, you know, that's also a way we can be, you know, in solidarity all together and also being inspired by each other because you not know, having shows like A Different World, like uh, Fresh Prince of Bella or like The Could Be Show, to us was really meaningful, but at the same time, it was also echoing something that was not possible in France. It's not possible to have an old black show on regular TV in France. It's not possible to have, for example, a black channel. Like we 
do have BET, but BET is American. I was a host for BET in France, but it was, you know, I was hired by the US. But perhaps you can tell the experience, oh, like yes. you joining BET, French BET. Perhaps you can share with the yes, audience. So, uh, yeah, when BET announced, so <laughs> when BET announced that they were coming to France, they presented a picture with two hosts that were not black. Like, so they were not white. Like in their promotional? Yeah, the, the, the two hosts of the channel. So they were not white. So like one of them was Asian, the other one was North African. But they didn't even think of having hosts that were black for BET France. And the response was like, of course, very angry. And that's how I came to be hired. Um, because, yeah, because, because the two hosts were are actually friends of mine. And um, they didn't know what to do. They, they, they didn't even think that people would be angry. Like the B of B E T. The first word. That's the first word. It's very easy to understand the purpose of the channel. Yeah. Yeah. The name is very explicit. You get lost in translation. Yeah. <laughs> so, like, that's something that is very French. Like, to forget that um, something black has to be black. <laughs> That's very American also. Yes. <laughs> we, are, we are more similar than we are. Yes, we are really today. similar. But at the same time, for me, BET as a host was a platform where I think it's the only place in France where you, can have, where you could have a, a black journalist interviewing black uh, artists or you know, intellectuals about things that were related to blackness or not. And that never happens. And that happens through an, an American platform. So that's still like a uh, you know, discursive way of doing things. But I think that you know, that inspiration, the fact that things uh, that, that are not really allowed in France exist in the US also give us strength. For example, we can, you can speak about hip hop, for example, in France. Um, the, how France was the, the, is the, the second nation of, of hip hop. And like the, in, in, my, in, in the documentary, there was um, a short clip of uh, that uh, TV show that which name was Achipe uh, Achopé, uh, which started in the in 1984, and it was the first show globally about hip hop, the first TV show on hip hop. And Sydney, who was hosting the show, was the first black person to host the show in France. And like I interviewed, thanks to Mabula, I interviewed Chuck D uh, years ago, 10 years ago. She, she invited him in France, and he told me that at that time, for American uh, rappers. It, the only place that could be on TV was France. So it's interesting how like French uh, minorities used that culture to frame their own concerns and to voice their concerns and made it actually mainstream sooner as in the US. So that's also like, I think that getting inspirations from, from one another and also using the rooms that are made in you know, one side uh, of the Atlantic or, uh, or uh, in the other to, to, to be there is also a way to work together. Yeah. Okay. And, and so what does it mean for you to be so in the US today or how have other screenings outside of hexagonal France been you know, received? What was the reaction? Do you see, like is there anything particular that, uh, that like, has struck you? Yes, I see that some here, like for example, people are more shocked uh, by what, what was the thing like uh, um, some some images in France are so you know commonly accepted that people don't react, react the same way. I heard some reactions here that I did that I did don't hear in France. That was interesting because we are to to us it's so normal to see uh, that comedian Michel Leb or. You know the the, the, the the cookies bamboula that were you know sold until the 90s. I, I I had some of them as a child. So and that didn't and like bamboula, there is an anecdote I have to tell you about bamboula. So it's um, uh, so it's a, a cookies that was named uh, bamboula, and they created a, a park. And they, they made people coming a, from uh, a theme park, a theme right, park, an amusement, an African, amusement park, yes. uh, an African amusement park, and they made and made people come from uh, Côte d'Ivoire to be part of the park, and it was in 1994. Yes, like it's it's insane. Like yeah, it was it was in uh, in the in the west of France, and it was a, uh, an amusement park op open to the public and. People who were there complained because they, they they were made fun of, and it was like. And it didn't spread any controversy at that time. Mm. 
And, you know, we are rediscovering it now, like today in 2022, but it was part of something that was, you know, very well accepted in France. And the, the amusement park was inspired by the cookies. So that's, yeah. Do we need to say that it was a chocolate cookie? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I think the people understood the, the just, subtext. Just, just making sure, just making sure. Okay. So Imani and Rokaya, what can you do together? What kind of uh, stories can you tell? Can you make? Can you put on screen? What could be possible? What could be the, the dream? I have, well, I mean, that's a, that's a really great question. It also wasn't in our prep question. <laughs> so she totally put me on the spot, but I appreciate it. Um, but that's I, based I, on the conversation is, we have. It is. Um, I, I would say that what I am really passionate about right now and where I feel is a, a, one of the threads in your film and also my work is, is just really the representation of black women on television. Mm -hmm. My first book is, is called Mammies, Matriarchs, and Mistresses. Um, black women in television, the history of black women in television. And I have long wanted to, to sort of look at the way in which we are, are seen, um, but also the, in particular the way in which we're seen behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if anyone in here has seen a film called The Woman King. Yeah. Maybe. Twice. Good. Oh, wow. Twice. Three times. I'm going again this weekend <laughs> um, for the second time. But a, a director, Gina Prince Bythewood, who her first film, Love and Basketball, changed my life mm -hmm. in 1999 and, and repeatedly. And I think of the way in which I've seen a lot of her um, press around the woman king and, and the conversation around the, 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 the strong women in front of the screen, but also behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. And so I would love, I think we should do something about black women behind the scenes. I think oh, we should. I'd love to. And I, I, thank you so much for the, I'd love to. And I have to, I have to say that I'm really sorry not to have mentioned Eusanne Palsy in my film. It's like my deep regret. I don't know what happened, but she's the first um, woman actually to, to have a César for being the best director in 1982 or 83. Wow. She's yeah. She's uh, she's the only woman. She's she's the woman who directed the uh, into Sugarcane Alley. Yes, it, yeah, yeah. Sugarcane Alley, but also a dry white season. She's the only woman who directed Marlon Brando, really? and she's yeah, wow. it's the only yeah, yeah. She's French. She's from Guadeloupe, Martinique. 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 She's from Martinique, and she doesn't work that much now. She's, yeah, she, I saw her, she, she, got, she got a prize, a very official prize, very, a couple of months ago. And she told, she, it was very sad because she, she told that I, I love France and France don't love me back. And she really, like, she wants to work and she's so great. She's so, you know, she, she was selected at the Mostra in Venice and, but she doesn't work. And um, when Maimouna Ducouré, who is in the film, uh, got her Caesar, she, she really, you know, pay homage, homage to her work. She really tell, told how she was inspired by her. And I think that we, we also need to, to tell about those, 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 those women. These black women directors, I was, I don't know if anyone also here is watching or has watched Queen Sugar. I'm obsessed with Ava DuVernay, but one of the things that I love about Ava DuVernay's intentionality with the entire seven series or seven seasons of Queen Sugar is that it was all women directors. Mm -hmm. And when she went to Oprah Winfrey as executive producer and said, I only want to hire women to direct like every episode for every season, Oprah was like, I think that's great. But there are so many amazing um, black women um, here as well as France that I, mm -hmm. like we're, we're talking about it now. This is we a pre-production meeting. Yes. <laughs> pre-production meeting. Thank you. Organized and hosted by the March on the Washington <laughs> Film Festival. Executive <laughs> produced by Isis Sarabe. <laughs> you heard it here. Yeah, I'm happy to produce this one too. Yeah, exactly. Oh, wow. <laughs> Teamwork. Teamwork makes the dream work. I'm serious. Exactly. Perhaps to go back to uh, the actual documentary, Okaya, can you tell us about how you selected the people you chose yeah. to interview and where are they now? So, um, so Aisa Maiga was um, obvious to me because she's the only black actress that people can name. Uh, when it comes to France, like the, the like the, the if you if you name someone, she, she's still the only name. 
uh, uh, which came came in mind. And she's also the one of the few, if not the only, who ha who's been able to have parts that were not written for black women. For example, the film that she mentioned, in which she's not uh, on the on the poster, was not meant for a black woman. The the, the character is it's just a classical. You know, uh, rom-com, yes, with someone who could not have been black. So, and it was in 2006. Yeah. So she's a, she's a kind of trailblazer, and she also directed a, a film, a documentary about black women um, in cinema. The, the film is named Regard Noir, and she, in the film, there are archives of her back to 2000, telling about being a black woman in French cinema. So she's been very consistent of, the, of that. She was the first and she's been consistent. Even being successful, successful, she didn't drop that part of her activism. So to me, it was obvious. Um, I think that um, the others, I don't know, I, want, I wanted to cover you know, all kinds of, uh, of expression. I also wanted to have right, white people who had power to decide. So, like, um, because it was interesting, I, I cut a lot from the, that woman from uh, Nguyen. Uh, she said things that <laughs> wouldn't be, yeah, like that, that, that's more interesting, but uh, she wouldn't look good <laughs> if, I, if I kept those parts. But it was interesting because, because she was the head of MCS, which is a very important channel, and she was also the one who was in, uh, in, uh, directing the channel when uh, Sonia Roland get the, the, the part in Lea Parker, the TV series with the, the spy the spy woman. And like there are some people that, that, that many things have happened after, after that. Um, for example, we can speak about the fact that uh, last year in the, during the César, uh, Fatia, uh, what's her name? So Maimouna Dukure directed uh, another film and Fatia, I don't remember her last name, she's very young, she's only 15, she got the uh, best uh, meilleur espoir, so the best... Um, Breakthrough? Yes. Like for, first? Yes, yes as, a, as a female actor. Yes. For me, for cuties, uh, yes, the, the Netflix, uh, the Netflix uh, film. Um, there that, that have been some chance, and Alice Diop, who is not in my documentary, just uh, won two. Uh, like after my film, she won two prizes on the Berlin Film Festival, and she just won two uh, lions in uh, the Venice film. She's a, she's French. She's a, from a Senegalese background, and she's great. She's, she, her film will, re will represent France for uh, for the Oscars. So hopefully, it will go through the, the category of the best foreign film. But she, like, there, there are many things that, hap, that, ha, that hap, are happening. And Lupin, Lupin, um, Lupin uh, just came after uh, my film. And it's interesting because it was, it's not French. I think it's, uh, it's authored by someone who is English. So like, and it's also strength, 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 strength the, the position of uh, Omar on an international level because I really give, gave him much, much, much strength. And, uh, and so many things happened and are still happening now. Like uh, Alice Diop, her film is, um, you know, the two main characters are black women. And it's based on a, on a true story. It's her interpretation and it's about motherhood. And it's, yeah, it's, it's very interesting because it's the kind of, of, of people that you don't see on screen. And it's not even the, the topic. And when she won her prize, uh, in Venice, she quote Audrey Lord. Mm -hmm. our, our silence won't, uh, won't, save, won't protect us. Yeah. And she, she quoted her very purpose, purposely, and that was very powerful and very strong to have her, you know, being uh, awarded by Julianne Moore and quoting Audrey Lord to just connect our stories as black women, you know, all over the, all across the Atlantic uh, Ocean. Thank you. <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> So before we close up, there were just a couple of ends I wanted to share with you all that came up in the conversation. It was so much we could continue to talk about. When you mentioned Uzan Palsy, uh, we were hoping to have her here. She just won a special Academy Award, and her film, Sugarcane Alley, has been remastered and will be released in uh, a few weeks. And we had wanted to air it now, but they asked us to wait so the remix could happen. Mm -hmm. uh, but she was going to come. That is a very wonderful film, Sugarcane Alley. It's um, about a young boy in a colonial 
island, one of the islands, it doesn't say, but his rite of passage, um, I showed it to my daughter and her friends when they were going through a rite of passage at about 12 or 13 years old. The other thing I wanted to note about uh, Uzan Palsy is that several years ago, we showed another of her films at a family day. She did a film on Ruby Bridges for Disney that you can still see, and that's Ruby Bridges is the young woman who integrated the New Orleans public schools. Uh, and, yes. and if I may, Ozan Palsy with Sugarcane Alley used, um, you know, a, a novel from a Martinican by the name of um, uh, Joseph Zobel. So that's actually a novel that she adapted. And she, she was in her 20s. That was her first movie and this masterpiece. I think she was like 25 or 26. And she got the involvement of the island, but also in hexa hexagonal friends for the release of the movie, she called on the Caribbean community. She said, you need to support the movie. And she called all the, you know, on the Caribbean families that were in hexagonal France and said, you need to flock to the theaters so that we can get, you know, like high sales for the opening weekend. And, and, and this, this was also a community moment and they supported the, 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 the movie so that it would stay in theaters uh, as long as it stayed. And it is a beautiful movie. It's wonderful. And she was 25. Yeah. Wow. yeah. Yeah, so, so one other thing I wanted to ask you, um, Rakaya, is can you tell us about your newest film? I just read like a couple of days ago about the, the new film you've done, and I said that might be good for our next festival. Tell us about Booty. Ah, this one. <laughs> so yes, my, 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 like my, my latest documentary uh, name is Bootyful. And it's about, like, I, I was wondering how come, especially in France, because we've always um, praised very slim um, women, you know, it's the image that we've had and that is, that is promoted in France. And I've, I've, I've noticed that the younger generation were more and more praising women with, uh, you know, more uh, round shapes and especially booties. And I saw that on Instagram, and I wanted to focus on that and to ask and to, 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 uh, to question how the booty have been such a, a criteria of beauty for the younger generations. So my film is, uh, is, a, is, a, is a, on that, and is a, you know, an exploration of that and how also it's connected to the history of the prejudices on, on the bodies of black women. Mm -hmm. So it was made for a younger audi audience in France, for a 15 to 25 audience, which is very interesting because it made me able to speak about all, you know, hip hop, Instagram. And uh, I interviewed historians, sociologists, hip hop artists, um, also dancers. Uh, about that, about the, 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 the and uh, it's also about cultural appropriation, how, you know, traditional African dances have been yes. made very mainstream and like how many people and think that Miley Cyrus invented the twerk. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> yeah. so it's tr trying to debunk also those kinds, those kind of, uh, of beliefs. <laughs> well, good. We look forward to that. Yes. Please thank our panel. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Thank you. And I just, I just, sorry, I, I just uh, want to add something is that the, the, the film Beautiful will be, will be screened in Georgetown on Tuesday at 5. So if you oh, want to come okay. to see it, it will be, will be screened in the, the first screening in uh, subtitle in English. So come and see it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Smart conversation. Before we segue into the next part of our evening, I just want to give you a taste of what else is still in store at the Marshall Washington Film Festival. Right after this, we'll say goodbye to our virtual audience. We will open that door to our DJ after party with DJ Terry the Hippie and Afrobeat music. So uh, if you're all scared to dance, you can run away. But if you are ready to get down, it's quite all right. Uh, we have a full day tomorrow here at Eaton. We will have again all afternoon a VR salon, and these are finished VR pieces uh, that have been done around social justice issues. And so you go upstairs on the second floor, you put on the headsets, and you sit in the chair, and you get to have a wonderful VR experience. Part of what we are working with in our equity lab is the movement of virtual reality from gaming to other aspects of life. Now, we know it's coming, right? We know in another 10, 20 years, we'll be doing everything VR some kind of way. But right now, we want to see how the medium can be used to help with the issues that are really important to people. We have a screening in the morning 
from 10 o'clock, right across uh, the hall is a screening room, and you'll see the 12 films in our student and emerging filmmaker competition, the, the finalists, short films. At noon, if you have young people in your life, come back for the next narrative monologue performance and competition. So for over 20 years, Kenny Leon's True Colors Theater in Atlanta has been putting on a national teen monologue competition. For about 20 years, it was the August Wilson monologue competition. But in the last couple of years, they are now using monologues by emerging African-American playwrights. So we're going to hear from some of the winners, and then they will transition into a workshop for local teens to learn how to select, prepare, and practice, rehearse dynamic monologues. So if there are any actors in your life or public speakers, bring them back for that. Uh, in the afternoon at 5, the second part of our Virtual Reality Lab is a fellows program where we've selected three fellows who have virtual reality projects that are in progress. They're partway, halfway through. So they will pitch those pro projects in order to win money to help finish their projects. And we are inviting the general audience to that. There'll be a reception right after, and this just happened this week. We'll be showing a sneak preview of a film by one of my friends and favorite actors. Her name is Sarah Jones. She won a Tony for her one-woman show on Broadway called Bridge and Tunnel. She's had several. Sarah does all of the characters and all of the voices. Uh, I met her early on in her career, and she told us about how she went to the UN high school in New York, lived in Queens, and uh, in order to get some of her friends out of school so they could play hooky, they would go to the pay phone, she would go on the phone, call the office and imitate the parents' voices in their accents to get that she, uh, uh, Priya has to come home, and Jose has to come home. She'd go through the panoply of accents to get them out. She is very dynamic, and now they've made a film of her most recent play, Sell By Date, and uh, Meryl Streep is her mentor and the express uh, executive producer. So that's free at 8 o'clock here. The film comes out in theaters later in the month, but we get a sneak preview. And then on Sunday, our closing event, we're very excited about, a new musical by Charles Randolph Wright. He is the composer of the Broadway musical uh, Motown. Um, that what ran for several years, and this one is on the life and in the words of Frederick Douglass. It's called American Prophet. It just had a run a month long at Arena, so we're going to have a concert of some of the songs from the play with the two leads, and Charles will do the narration and weave some of the script in between. That will be followed by a panel of some of the leaders of the regional theaters in the country, the Apollo, Woolly Mammoth, Arena, True Colors, and the new head of the theater arts department at Howard University. So please join us for that. We're going to be talking about the state of American theater. So two more days of wonderful things. We hope you'll join us. Thank you so much this evening for joining us. Thank you for those on the virtual. Have a lovely evening. But stay for some food and some dancing. <laughs>